Depending on the season of the year, there are buds that are growing on the trees. Our person of the year, Ralph Bud Gallo, is certainly a man for all seasons, the likes of which do not grow on trees. Our Bud was nurtured on his grandfather's farm in upstate Pennsylvania. After attending the Navy Radio School, Bud grew at Center City Philadelphia's Philadelphia Wireless Institute. Bud's broadcasting career blossomed at radio stations here in Pennsylvania and in nearby Delaware, including WBRE in Wilkes-Barre, WDOV in Dover, Delaware, and WEEX in Easton. It was in the early 50s that Bud put down roots for 40-some years at KYW. He was on the board when WRCV became KYW. WRCV, NBC in Philadelphia. It was a guess. Good morning. This is KYW Philadelphia. He was there when KYW News Radio hit the airwaves in September of 1965. All news and only news. This is KYW News Radio at 12 noon, and I'm Steve Porter. He was there when the nuclear accident hit Three Mile Island. This breaking story has just come in. State police in Harrisburg have been called to the Three Mile nuclear plant. He was there when the Liberty Bell moved from Independence Hall into its own pavilion on the mall. The bell is in position. Outside here, you can hear the Centennial Bell atop uh, Independence Hall has begun to toll 200 times. He was a studio engineer, spent time at the transmitter, and filled production recording engineer duties before becoming studio supervisor. Asked to recall memorable colleagues from over the years proved to be a tough challenge for Bud. But he singled out Andrea Mitchell, whom he helped coach. Bill Green has given a victory statement to the crowd. Bill Branson, because he was a former DJ and wanted to stay on just to see if he could become a good newsman. Good afternoon, everyone. It's 54 degrees. We all know how that turned out. And KYW's Harrisburg Bureau Chief Sandy Sterevin, who kept feeding reports after he lost his sight. I don't know how he did it, said Bud. The court's decision was a long time in coming. It sprung from a case that began in 1964. But I admired his strong desire to keep reporting. The emphasis in broadcasting is on the folks behind the microphone. At KYW, it was the man behind the glass that often made all the difference in their world. We are grateful to have been blessed by the presence of Bud Gallo. It was exciting. It was a great time for me. Please put your hands together as we celebrate our 2017 Person of the Year, Ralph Bud Gallo. When I was told by Jerry that I was going to be the man of the year and I should write a 10-minute script, I did. I'm just going to throw it away. I think very few of you know of my upbringing and uh, that I grew up on a farm up in the Poconos. And at this time of the year, we would be butchering. And uh, my uncle would go out and show, shoot a deer, and we'd get a, a front section of beef and butcher a pig and make sausage and scrapple and a few other things. Uh, just quickly, I was in high school, at Fairview High School, and we were doing gymnastics because the gym teacher said we were going to be drafted, so you might as well start doing the gymnastics now. And I climbed the rope to touch the ceiling, and the eyeball broke. So it put me in the hospital for a while. I broke my back in a couple of places. And uh, when I got home, my father built uh, handrails around in the house so I could learn to walk. And I thought, well, I, I have to go to the service. But I would have been 4F, I'll bet. No, I didn't tell the Navy anything. I just went down and enlisted and went to uh, Samson Naval Training Base in New York. From there, went to radio school because when we finished the high at uh, Samson, they said, "Does anybody here uh, can read Morse code?" And I put my hand up. I'd been a Boy Scout. And I had to learn the code for the merit badge. 
So there was three of us were sent, four of us were sent to Bainbridge, Maryland to go to radio school. And upon graduation at radio school, the four of us, Gallagher, Fox, Fales, and Gallo, wound up uh, in San Francisco and, uh, and transshipped to uh, Pearl Harbor. And from there, we got on to uh, a little pokey boat that was about that wide and uh, went to NOE Talk. And the ships came in to pick up the people who were being assigned there. And we were told to get our gear, get in the whale boat, and they were going to take us to the ship. Okay, you know, that's fine. We get over there. And it, it, the main deck is like 35 feet in the air. We're down here. And, and with a sea bag on your shoulder, that weighed about 100 pounds. And the OD standing up there says, come on, sailor, you can make it. Run, run, run. So we did. And I remember very clearly... The chief, no, first class took us to dinner because we hadn't had anything to eat for a couple of days. So we went to dinner and we got chocolate cake for dessert. Now you know we've got it made, right? So it was at, on the USS Tennessee where I learned to be a communicator. Uh, I was in communication with the spotters on the beach and the spotters in the aircraft and uh, the people who I talked to were uh, fire controlmen who ran these little computer things. I have no idea how they work. And so they would tell me and give me a coordinate on the map, and I would say, okay, L16, and they'd set it up. And I'd pull the triggers, and I'd say fire, and then the next thing when it would calculate when the shell exploded, and I would tell him, splash, and the guy would say, okay, up five and two left. So we'd go up five and two left, and it was, it was an interesting thing. When I got out of the service, my father, thinking I could use a good job, got me a job driving a lumber truck. And after about six months of that, I decided that that wasn't for me for a future, and came to Philadelphia to go to see if I could learn to be a, an air traffic controller. I thought that would be good. I met a gentleman at the, who was standing in line behind me, and we were both waiting to go into Drexel. And he said, oh, let's not stand around here. Come on, we'll go. I know where we'll go. We went down to 16th and Pine, and that was the uh, Philadelphia Wireless Technical Institute, and that's where we got our, our training. I graduated from there with a uh, first class uh, radio license, but now I couldn't get a job in, in the business because at that time, to be an engineer in a radio station, you had to have a first class license. That was number one. And number two, you had to have an endorsement on the back. So now, how do you get an endorsement on the back if you can't get the job? I worked for free at WBRU in Wilkesboro. And eventually, Charlie Sikoski called me in and said, OK, I'm going to sign your license, and I want you to go down to Dover, Delaware, and start to work in broadcasting. And that was the beginning. I went down there and uh, worked there for a couple of years until I became the chief engineer. And <laughs> I got called back to BRE. I went back to BRE, and there was a guy who was drafted, and he went to uh, the Army, and the Army rejected him out of about a month, and so he's back, and I'm out at Liberty once more. Uh, I found a job at Easton. I worked at Easton for a short time until I got a phone call from a former engineer at WDOV in Dover, Delaware, who said KYW is looking for an engineer. So I set a record over the road from Easton to Center City, Philadelphia, was interviewed, was hired, and uh, two weeks later I was working at a KYW, 50,000 watts, major city. I got it made, you know, wow. That wasn't quite true. 
because the chief engineer who looked at me when I was, I had, I digress. I first thought that broadcasting was like a troika. It was an engineer, a salesman, and talent. If you didn't have one of those, the other, the other two were non-existing. So I became friendly with all the talent I could outside of the air studio. And uh, Mr. Reney didn't like that because I was socializing with the people on the other side of the glass. Now, you know who you are, <laughs> and so do I. And we learned, I learned that they had the same kind of foibles and worries that I had, and we were good friends. So uh, that made me successful. And uh, when Westinghouse turned the FM station, KYWFM, over to the Philadelphia Board of Education to become WHYY, I was cut loose. Now, I really wasn't cut loose because he felt sorry for me, I think, because <laughs> he got me a job at CAU. So I was working at KYW on Friday, and on Monday I was at WCAU. And I was there for six months. And one day the phone rang, and they said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm working. Oh, all right. We'd like to have you come back to KYW. I said, well, how about Mr. Doreeny? Doesn't he have something to say about this? And they said, no, he was fired two weeks ago, and now Roy Nelson is the chief engineer, and he wants you back here now. So I told the management people, and they said, well, you want to go? Go. You can go. So I came back to KYW, and then I stayed there for the next 40 years. I couldn't find another job. <laughs> uh, so I want to just say one thing from my speech, if I may. Uh, I'm going all the way to page 10, right? Uh, I, it, was, it was September the 16th, 1965, and I'm the wake-up man in the studio, and Pat Delsey is on standby in the announce booth. Pat signs off with, quote, I hope you're ready for this. Will be the last time, probably, I will ever be seeing you. It was a guess. Huh? I, why did you say it was a guess? I don't know. Any help, Pat? So then he took a short pause and then he said, this is KYW owned and operated by the Westinghouse Broadcasting Company operating on an assigned frequency of 1060 kilocycles with studios located at 1690 Walnut Street and transmitter located at 5090 Joshua Road, Whitemarsh, VA. This is KYW bidding you good morning. And now in the twilight of my career, I've been chosen by you the broadcast pioneers of Philadelphia for this great honor, and I am humbled. Let me say my heartfelt thanks, and till we meet again, I'll be the same. <laughs>